The sages of Judaism say that the second temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred. Yeshua the Messiah came with the antidote to baseless hatred, the key to redemption from exile, baseless love. Messiah Podcast is brought to you by First Fruits of Zion, providing Messianic Jewish teaching for Christians and Jews. Put your hand in mine together. We will walk in harmony. Let me introduce you to my teacher, the rabbi from the Galilee. Well, welcome back to Messiah Podcast Selects, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. I'm Jacob Franzek, and I'm here with my co-host, Damian Eisner, the director of Torah Club. How are you doing, Damian? I am doing wonderful. It's it's uh, it's the three weeks, though. You know, the 17th of Tammuz was last week, so we're in these very, very long, hot, dry days, not only of summer, but of this, this season here. Uh, of the three weeks leading up to Tisha B'Av. So it's always a very contemplative and sort of, uh, I don't know what, I'm not sure of what the word is, but I'm I'm in the three weeks. How's that? Well, the timing for that is, uh, is something because today we're going to be talking a little bit. Well, we're not going to be talking. We're going to be listening to a lecture by our colleague Aaron Eby, director of Vine of David, that has to do with the reason for the destruction of the temple, which is, the, the anniversary of which is Tisha B'Av, both right. temples, according to Jewish tradition, destroyed on Tisha B'Av and several other calamities that befell the Jewish people. Um, and Aaron gives us the reason for the destruction of the temple, which is baseless hatred, and the solution or the the um, antidote, which is baseless love. Um, right. So I guess, I guess it's a timely uh, podcast for us. Absolutely. Ahavat chinam. Right, I, thought, I, I, I was too afraid to try to pronounce the Hebrew. I, I, I'm not so good with the Hebrew. Oh my goodness, my friend! I speak Deep South Hebrew, so I am certainly oh. not your best source of uh, pronunciation guidance for Hebrew. But it, that, but that is what it is. Ahavat chinam. Ahavat chinam. So this lecture of Aaron's, actually, you know, from the Malchut 22 conference, th- this was the most popular lecture that took place at the conference and it really as as everyone listens to it you'll see why as it is such a has such a point of modern connection and i think that's what everyone in that room was feeling as he was delivering it and hopefully we can add a few uh few good comments to to back up aaron's great lecture at the end of this yeah yeah i mean all of you did great but yeah, this was this was my favorite. I won't say it was the best one because you're all very good, but it was my favorite. Um, because he, yeah, you're right. He just has the finger on the pulse of where everything's at right now. So, absolutely. Let's let's give it a listen. We'll get right into it. Yeah, and you can watch this in pristine video. You can find it at torcluborg slash malchut m a l c h u t. If you want to know the Jewish Jesus, don't miss out on a free subscription to Messiah Magazine, where you'll discover his life and teaching, learn about the biblical festivals, and get connected with Israel. Subscribe for free at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is a free, donation-supported quarterly publication of First Fruits of Zion. The temple was destroyed because of a a typo on a party invitation. (laughs) Did you know this? Uh, Now, I'm guessing, actually, some of you have heard this story. Um, So a certain Jewish man in first century Jerusalem, history didn't record his name, held a banquet. And so he told his servant, this is not a parable, this is a real thing. (laughs) He told his servant, Go and invite my friend, Kamsa. So his servant dutifully set forth on this task, and he found a fellow in town whose name was Bar Kamsa. 
oh, this must be the one that my servant or my master was talking about. Uh, he pre presumed wrongly. So the day of the party comes. And the banquet hall is buzzing with guests. And the servants are scurrying in and out. And they're piling the, the, the tables high with, with gourmet di dishes and delicacies. And the, the top rabbis are there. This is, a, this is a swanky party. The top rabbis are there. Other prominent and wealthy men of Jerusalem are there. And the unnamed host is making his rounds. And he's schmoozing and he's laughing and he's wondering why his good friend Kamsa didn't show up at his banquet. And meanwhile, the man Bar Kamsa is having a great time. He, he's a little surprised that he got invited to this party, considering that he and the host don't really get along very well. You know, maybe this is the, way, the host's way of uh, smoothing things over, saying it's okay. Uh, and maybe reaching out and mending the relationship. But just at the moment that Bar Kamsa stuffs his mouth with one of the delectable, delectable entrees on the table, the host storms up. This guy is my enemy. And some heads turn. Why did you come here? Get up, get out. And now Bar Kamsa realizes the mistake. Hey, 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 no, no need to make a scene, all right? Uh, just, just, you know, just let me finish my food and, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for what I ate. Now, no, you will do what I told you and you will get out of here, the host demanded. You know, more guests are start starting to notice the commotion. Now, Bar Kamsa would not be able to tolerate the humiliation, the embarrassment of being asked to leave. So he says, I tell you what, tell you what, let me stay and we'll go 50 50. We'll, I'll, I'll split the cost of this banquet with you. I said, get out. And now the room is silent. Hey, hey. Just let me stay, and I will cover the cost of this entire banquet. No, you will leave immediately. And the host grabbed Bar Kamsa, and as Jerusalem's top rabbis looked on, and the most prominent and wealthy men stared, he dragged Bar Kamsa right out the door and threw him into the alley. So Bar Kamsa dusted himself off, now, being rejected by his enemy is not that big of a surprise, but what stung the most about this experience were the rabbis who sat there and did nothing while he was humiliated. He said, if this is what it means to be a religious Jew, then count me out. So he went to the Roman emperor, and he claimed, you know, the Jews are rebelling against you. They're in revolt right now. The emperor responded, really? I haven't heard this. According to whom? And Bar Kamsa said, tell you what, send a sacrifice on behalf of the empire. See if they offer it. Now, now normally there's no problem with the emperor send, sending a kosher sacrifice to the temple. That happened all the time. It was a, it was a gesture of goodwill. This was something that happened frequently. So the emperor said, okay, and he sent a calf with Bar Kamsa. He would bring it to the temple, bring it to the, uh, as a sacrifice on behalf of the empire. Well, Bar Kamsa inflicted a minor injury on that calf. A defect. It disqualified it but for a sacrifice by Jewish standards, not by Roman standards. So with a smug grin, he presented the emperor's offering to the priests in the temple. Uh, sages were not sure what to do about this. Because rejecting the offering would appear to be an act of revolt and could bring disastrous consequences, including violent retaliation. You know, should they offer the blemished animal anyway as a, a gesture of goodwill? And that's an option on the table. Well, Rabbi Zechariah bin Avkulas 
objected. That would set a dangerous precedent because then people will think it's okay to offer blemished sacrifices in God's holy temple. Now the sages were frightened by the, the potential loss of life. So perhaps they should kill Bar Kamsa so that he doesn't go back and report it to the emperor. So Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas again objected, well, if we do that, then people will think that defiling a, 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 a consecrated animal is a capital offense, and it's not. And you know, there's a good chance that Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas was one of those men at the banquet, and he felt a little sense of responsibility for what happened. So now the sages are paralyzed by their, by their options, and so they did nothing. They rejected the sacrifice. And Bar Kamsa was free to return to the emperor with the results. Now, was that the event, that mistaken invitation? Was that the event that really destroyed the temple, triggered the destruction of Jerusalem? I mean, surely there were more contributing factors than a single misunderstanding about a sacrifice. Why did the sages feel, though, that this story was necessary, that, that we would lay the blame of the destruction of the temple on this story involving Bar Kamsa? Especially considering that it doesn't really reflect well on the sages. Well, we'll discuss this a little more in a little bit, but let's talk about exile and redemption. Now, when I say exile, you know, Usually we think of exile as being kicked out of something, right? I don't just mean the physical displacement of the Jewish people from the land of Israel, although that is a big part of it. Exile is the name for the condition of the world being distant from the kingdom of heaven. So it's the dark condition of our world right now as we long for the return of our master Yeshua. Now, the Messiah's job is to be the ultimate redeemer. And so redemption is the reversal of exile, the restoration of the world to its ideal state, bringing the kingdom. So there is a, the good news is that there is a path forward. There is a solution to this problem of exile. The bad news is there's also a very convincing counterfeit solution. This counterfeit is a collective manifestation of our yetzer hara, our, our animalistic impulses. And that it is called factionalism. Factionalism. Factionalism does a very good job, a surprisingly good job of acting like the good guy. It feels like it's simply standing up for what's good and right and true and condemning what's evil. And it feels like justice, giving people what they deserve. So it seems reasonable that to bring redemption and to lift society, we just need all the good people to join forces and insulate against ourselves against the wicked and wrong people. Well, factionalism feels righteous and it feels holy. However, what factionalism does is what it says right on the label. It creates a world of intransigence, an absence of empathy. Factionalism is a self-defensive reflex in the disguise of rational thought. Factionalism extends Exile. It does not reverse it. And what's more, factionalism self-amplifies. It makes people feel more disconnected, more isolated from others, and more troubled about society. So as a result, factions break into smaller and smaller groups. More and more factions. So in this lecture, we're going, to dis we're going to discuss 
the real solution to the problem of exile. We'll talk about our master's prophetic insight in his message for his generation. We'll see how he presented the cure to exile even before the temple was destroyed. And we'll learn how we can implement his plan in our generation to bring the work of redemption one step closer to fulfillment. Now, the generation who saw Yeshua with their own eyes, when they looked at him, what did they see? They perceived him to be a prophet. Very common, and it says that in the New Testament. It's a prophet. And that's because he spoke like a prophet. You know, like Moses, who offered the, the choice between life and death, between blessing and curse, Yeshua presented two choices, two alternatives to his people, and he called them to action. So Luke describes how Yeshua wept when he perceived that Israel would not heed his message. It says in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but they, now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you, and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you to, down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Yeshua vividly described the Roman invasion and siege of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. He indicated that the destruction of the temple would be the consequence of the actions of his generation. He borrowed this phrase, time of visitation, or more, accu more accurately, time of reckoning from the prophet Jeremiah. Yeshua made it clear that there is a parallel between the first temple and the second temple. The Babylonians destroyed the first temple because the generation failed to heed the warnings of Jeremiah the prophet and the other prophets. Who, who, who prophesied its destruction. And in the same way, the Romans were able to destroy the second temple because the Jewish people in Yeshua's day failed to heed his prophetic message. You know, think through this logically. If the generation had heeded Yeshua's message, Yeshua would not have wept over the city. He would have looked over the city and rejoiced over it. The Romans would not have hemmed it in on every side and torn the temple to the ground. That wouldn't have happened. The exile would not have occurred. That means that Yeshua's teachings provide the cure to the sickness of the generation that led to this terrible exile. Yeshua's words are the things that make for peace. And yet, you know, even as the donkey carried him into Jerusalem and the throngs hailed him as king. He could see through the Holy Spirit that that city's fate was already sealed. The sages of the Gemara confirmed that exactly in that year, 40 years before the destruction of the temple, strange things started to happen in the temple. Ominous signs began to occur. And the sages interpreted those as warnings that the temple was about to be destroyed. Now, what was really wrong with that generation? Well, in the centuries that followed the destruction of the temple, the sages looked back with hindsight, kind of analysis, to determine the causes. What went wrong? You know, with the first temple, the answer was pretty easy, was, was obvious. There was idolatry, there was sexual immorality, there was murder... Uh, but the destruction of the second temple was, was especially puzzling, considering that that was a religious generation. The people were religiously observant people. They, so, so the sages analyzed and they said, okay, there are several sins that are to blame. The most prominent of them is the sin called sin at chinam, baseless hatred. 
Sinat Chinam. And as the Tosefta explains it, this is one of the rabbinic writings that analyzes it. It says, all right, we acknowledge that in the days of the Second Temple, they were laboring in the Torah. They were scrupulous with tithes. So why were they exiled? Because they loved money. They loved mammon. And each one hated his neighbor. This teaches that hatred of man against his neighbor is severe to the all-present. Scripture considers it equivalent to idolatry and immorality and bloodshed. Now, if you, if you ask me, this is one of the clearest points of evidence that our master spoke from a spirit of prophecy. Because he, Yeshua placed heavy emphasis on love for one's neighbor, on peaceful reconciliation of disputes. That was what he was saying. He directly confronted the sin of baseless hatred, the, the foremost offense to blame for this exile. Now, what did baseless hatred, what did Sinat Chinam look like? What was it, what it, was it practically looking like in the days of the Second Temple? Well, it began with uh, differences of opinion on po political issues, theological issues. You know, for example, like how, how should the Jewish community deal with the reality of the Roman occupation? It's a fair question, good question. So you had religious conservatives um, and you had Jewish nationalists, including the Pharisees who advocated resistance against Rome. You know, religious progressives such as the Sadducees felt that, well, Rome ruled by the will of God, uh, and, they, and they advocated full cooperation with, with the Roman Empire, and they denounced uh, any form of resistance. He had different, differing opinions. And then with the, within the religious conservative sector, you also had moderates who uh, felt like even though Rome was, uh, was a wicked enemy, yes, and they would be overthrown by the Messiah, all we can do in the meantime is seek Hashem and avoid uh, bringing down Rome's wrath on us. Those on the far right felt like the, the, the armed resistance in the spirit of the Maccabees, that was the, that's the only solution. So, you know, to capitulate to Roman demands, that would be a betrayal of Hashem and it would be a betrayal of the Jewish people. So you know what? Having differences of, of opinion is not a problem. If you've ever been involved in, in the Jewish community, you know that that's just a part of life. It's a, part, it's a good thing, right? It gives us something to talk about. But the problem is when those political divisions factionalized the Jewish people. Healthy discourse was replaced by a climate of hostility, a climate of hatred, of sinat chinam. And each one began to see the other as enemies. Now, in religious terms, the, the zealots were Pharisees, right? So as Pharisees, that's a theological statement. They believed in the authority of the Torah. They believed in the authority of the prophets. They believed in the coming of the Messiah. They believed in the, the existence of the soul. They, they believed in divine punishment, divine reward in the afterlife. They believed in the resurrection of the dead. That's Pharisaism. But the zealots also idealized armed resistance. They organized into secret militia groups. Josephus describes them in this way. He, he said, these men have an inflexible devotion to liberty. They say that God is, their, is to be their only ruler and master. They do not fear any manner of death nor are they unwilling to sacrifice the lives of their families and friends. So zealots, zealot extremists resorted to domestic terrorism, not just against the Romans, but against their fellow Jews to get their way. So that included setting fire to villages of enemies, taking hostages, an assassination of people that they considered collaborators. Rome's response to terrorism was overwhelming and disproportionate. You know, massacres, arrests, crucifixions. 
And that oppressive force from Rome only fed into the, the extremism and the desperation of the zealots. And so it created this vortex cycling in on itself of violence and hatred. The Jerusalem Talmud describes how the school of Shammai uh, was so desperate to enact measures to separate Jews from their pagan influences. So they held the, the students of, 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 of the school of, of, of Hillel at knife point and physically attacked them to prevent them from entering the court in order to vote. And by doing this, they were able to achieve a majority and, in, and in, to enact 18 matters of legislation, of, of, uh, of Torah legislation. And the sages called that day the hardest day for the Jewish people since the golden calf was made. In that hor horrific climate, it, it starts to make sense why James would remind his readers that the same Torah that says do not commit adultery also says don't murder. Uh, during the Roman siege of Jerusalem, more Jews died from war in the city with, uh, from war within the city before the Romans even got there than died from the Roman assault. From civil war. Rome did not destroy Jerusalem. When religious and political groups became terrorist militias, Jerusalem destroyed itself. The pressure of the Roman occupation was an accelerant on an already kindled fire. Between the New Testament, um, the eyewitness account of Josephus, the post-mortem reflections of the sages, we begin to see how strife and, and, and political rivalry and corruption led Jewish religious society to a complete breakdown. And Yeshua could see this process unfolding before his eyes. With the clarity and the, and, and the precision of a master physician, he began to diagnose and to identify each ailment in his society. While the religious community was pointing fingers at the, at the perversion of a Roman culture and the, and the encroachment upon the religious freedoms, all that stuff was red herrings. It wasn't about the Romans. Change needed to come from within. Yeshua was telling the religious community that they had the power to stem the tide and they had the power to prevent this disaster. God does not afflict Israel unless he has already provided a cure. This is a statement of the sages. The Jewish sages identified this spiritual principle. God does not afflict Israel until he has already provided a cure. Yeshua, or more precisely, Yeshua's teaching was the cure that God provided for the affliction of exile. Now, Yeshua didn't come to proselytize. We've talked about this. At no point in Yeshua's mission to Israel did he ever say, everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. And anyone who wishes to have me come into your heart, raise your hand. I see that hand. <laughs> it didn't happen. It didn't happen. He didn't come as a hero. He came as a shepherd, as a guide. He called people to repent. He didn't discriminate between the religious and the non-religious in that regard. Everybody needs to repent. To the secular folks, his message of repentance was, come closer. You belong in this people. God loves and he values you. To the religious, his message of repentance was, you are shutting the kingdom of heaven and you're not letting anyone enter. So what was Yeshua's cure for baseless hatred? What's the cure for sinat chinam? The answer is so simple, it seems to be pretty obvious. Baseless love, ahavat chinam. Baseless love. 
So in support for the message of baseless love, Yeshua cited this verse from the Torah. I think you know it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, love one another, that's not a difficult message to hear, not a difficult message to sell. Love. Most songs on the radio are about love. Love wins. Love is love. People love to love. You love your spouse. You love your friends. You love your children. Love is one of the greatest feelings of ever. ever. Who would ever be against love? You naturally love people who love you back. People who affirm you, who support you. No one is anti-love. Yeshua's message wasn't just love. That would not be much of a message. It was ahavat chinam, baseless love. What makes love baseless? This is how Yeshua describes it. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Whoever said hate your enemy? Who said that? Oh, Yeshua is pre simply presenting the popular interpretation of love your neighbor. Oh, it's just your neighbor. The term neighbor or, or fellow seems to uh, be a qualifier seems to imply that whoever doesn't qualify as neighbor should not be loved. So Yeshua corrects this faulty interpretation in his explanation of a havat chinam, or baseless love. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who, perse who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. The Hebrew word for baseless, the word chinam, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean baseless. It, it means free or, or gratuitous. Chinam means there's no exchange involved. It means you don't expect anything in return. Here's what Yeshua said. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your re reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Baseless love. It was baseless in the sense that it's unmerited. It's undeserved. An enemy deserves to be hated. That is what they, they deserve. Someone who persecutes you deserves retaliation. Not love. They don't deserve love. If you don't love the people who deserve to be hated, then your love isn't baseless, is it? In the same way, Yeshua teaches us to forgive repeatedly. Forgive it, forgiveness means choosing not to be an enemy of the person who has wronged you. Now, no one deserves forgiveness. If you think someone deserves forgiveness, it's not forgiveness. Forgiveness, by definition, is undeserved. If someone hurts you, they deserve to be hurt back. An eye for an eye. Forgiveness requires a conscious decision to deny someone what they have coming to them and to reconcile instead. That's what forgiveness is. Factionalism in the first century turned the Jewish people into a society of enemies. Each faction did whatever they could do to oppose, to defeat, to degrade, to bring down the other. And though Israel was together in the land, in their hearts they were already scattered over the face of the earth. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Did you know the Jewish tradition expects the coming of two messiahs, not one? Have you heard that? Now we understand that these two messiahs 
which are really two messianic tasks are to be completed by one person, Yeshua the Messiah, right? The first task, though, is called Messiah, son of Joseph. The job of Messiah, son of Joseph, is to do what Joseph did. What did he do? His brothers, the sons of of Jacob, were sick with hatred and strife. Joseph gathered them together. He gathered them together, binding them together in unity and love, even when they had every reason to hate one another and to abandon each other. He gathered them. This was Yeshua's mission to his people. Did you know that when, so when, I want to say when Rachel bore a son, uh, she said, God has gathered up my approach. You hear that? She, he gathered up my approach, re, re, gathered up my reproach. And he said, she said, may he add to me another son. So the name Yosef is actually connected both to this term of gathering and to, uh, and to add. But this was Yeshua's mission to his people as the son of Joseph. To gather them into one body through love. So when he foresaw the fate of Jerusalem, what did he say? Say He lamented. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I would have gathered you, gathered your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were unwilling. You were unwilling. So the the rejection of redemption was not so much a rejection of Yeshua as it was a rejection of one another, his message. They were not willing to gather. This is what he said. The religious with the secular, the progressives with the conservatives, the extremists with the moderates, they wouldn't gather. It's easy for us to point fingers at that generation that saw the destruction of the temple. Their society was filled with baseless hatred. They caused the, 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 the collapse of the temple, the scattering of the Jewish people. Surely, if we were in their shoes, we would have done better. I have some not so good news for you. We are in their shoes. This is what the Jerusalem Talmud says. Any, ge- any generation in which the temple is not built is considered to have destroyed it. If the, if the problems that led to the destruction of the temple had been fixed in our generation, then the temple would be standing right now. It would do us well to consider our master's words. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? but you don't notice the log that's in your own. Is our generation factionalized like theirs? Do we have infighting? Do we have divisions? Do we have quarrels? I can't speak for other countries, but baseless hatred in the United States is tearing us apart. It's also tearing up the Christian church. The country is amid an ideological and political divide in which hatred for the other side is considered the only moral thing to do. Each faction is completely unable to listen to the other side. The body of Messiah is fractured, and these divisions run deep between parents and children, between husbands and wives, between brothers and sisters. It's ironic that Yeshua's disciples are so commonly caught in this this problem of factionalism. This trap. As followers of the Messiah, we should be the ones leading the way in redemption. Heeding the call for repentance and baseless love is a task that belongs to the whole Jewish people. And you know what? In, unfortunately, we're not in any position to, to, to address them as a whole. We're not in that position. But we can change ourselves. You know, we often refer to ourselves as messianic, right? We're messianic, messianic Jews, messianic Gentiles. After all, why? Because we're clued into a deep secret, the identity 
of the Messiah. We're his disciples. We're his, we're his students. We are his servants. We are his agents in the world, his shlichim, his emissaries, especially right now while he's away. Now, if you're reversing the exile is Messiah's job. Bringing redemption is Messiah's job. And we are his agents, then guess what? It's our job. It's our job. It's not sufficient for us to sit back and wait for redemption to happen. We can't just point our fingers at the rest of the Jewish community. If we represent the Messiah and he's invested his power and his name in us, then the redemption of Israel is our job. And that means that our primary job, first step, the beginning of wisdom, is to mend ourselves. We must be gatherers, not scatterers. Our master taught, whoever is not, a, is not with me is against me, and who does, whoever does not gather with me scatters. That means that unwillingness to gather is tantamount to rejection of the Messiah. Far be it from us. Yeshua's message, his mission, was not to make converts, right? We've covered that. It was the revelation of God. It was bringing the kingdom. It was teaching love to counter baseless hatred. The Jewish sages could clearly see that the temple was destroyed and the Jewish people went into exile for the sin of baseless hatred. We all know that now. And the rejection of Yeshua was just one symptom of this condition. The history of the apostolic era shows us a Jewish people that was deeply divided on political and on theological ideologies, on, th on, on theological lines. A world that's very much like ours today, filled with baseless hatred, in a complete intrans intransigence, in a complete lack of empathy. It was a world of sloganeering. It was a world of political backstabbing. It was a world of civil unrest, a world of violence. And Yeshua's message of repentance called on his disciples to love their neighbors as themselves. The solution of the peop of, of, to the problem, solution that nobody wanted to hear, was ahavat chinam. It's to love, it's easy to love those who love us. That's easy. Easy. No one is anti-love. Yeshua calls his disciples to practice baseless love. Loving those who have done nothing to earn our kindness. Love your enemies. Love anti-missionaries. Pray for those who persecute you. Baseless love is love for those who don't, don't deserve to be loved. The love of Messiah teaches us to love others regardless of whether or not we deem them as lovable. Yeshua interpreted the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself to mean treating other people the way you would want them to treat you. That's his interpretation. And he defined neighbor as all humans. All humanity. In the case of social divide, love for others doesn't require capitulation to their ideology. This isn't what we're talking about. It requires basic kindness. It requires respect. It requires a genuine effort to understand the other. Disciples of Yeshua are called to love the stranger, to love the neighbor, to love your fellow disciple. And these imperatives redirect our engagement with every human being. They affect the way that we interact with every single person. And they require us to develop empathy, to go the extra mile, not just on the path, but in our thinking to go the extra mile, even for those who hate us, even for those who misuse us. We're to love other humans as ourselves. 
But our love for one another, our love for disciples have to, has to even exceed this. When I look out at this room, I'm seeing disciples of Yeshua. I'm seeing Yeshua reflecting back to me. It should inspire us with a feeling of, of being starstruck, of, of intense love. The love that you have for Yeshua should be in every single person. The tragedy of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, okay. So that was not, maybe not the singular event that led to the destructions of, of, of the temple that led the Romans to, to come against Israel. That wasn't the, the thing. In fact, there were probably lots of events just like that happening. And the story is important because every person, every character in that story bears some of the responsibility. Yeah, there was the, the hate-filled host, who uh, was unwilling to even consider the humanity of his opponent. There was Bar Kamsa, whose reaction to a moment of embarrassment was to betray his community of faith and his nation. And there were the rabbis present who saw a human being humiliated, who saw a man being degraded, and didn't feel like it was their responsibility to step in and bring peace. You know, maybe the, the rabbis succumbed to a, a psychological effect called the bystander effect. You know this one? It's a psychological phenomenon where a person is less likely to help others when there are other people around. Strange, but it, it's a, a, a big sickness in, in human psychology. But really, whoever doesn't gather scatters. That's, that's Yeshua's calling to us. Now, I understand how difficult it is to let go and to love despite hurts and offenses and ideological incompatibilities. We're all doing our best. But if we believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, if we really call him our master, if we call him our Lord, then we've got to trust him. We've got to trust him on this one. Yeshua saw the exile while it was still in the, on the horizon, while it was still reversible. He saw it. He knew why it was coming. He knew what the cure was. He told us the cure to the sickness even before the world was afflicted. Before the wound was inflicted on us. So let's follow his plan of action. First of all, we need to see all of humanity as a part of yourself. You are connected to every person in this universe. You realize that? You have a connection with them. No matter how different they are from you. Number two, love everybody, even if they don't deserve to be loved. Love people who don't deserve to be loved. And number three, love disciples, love the people in this room, even more than your own life. That's what Yeshua told us to do. It goes beyond love of, of your neighbor as yourself. And when we do this, we will end the exile. That's the recipe. So love doesn't mean you compromise on your principles. Doesn't mean that we lack boundaries. It doesn't mean that we don't identify with a group. Love means treating other people with care and finding common ground, even if that's simply common humanity. We can't let ourselves, our communities, eat themselves alive as they continue to fracture. We must no longer be passive spectators swept up by a world unable to, to bring about change. You have become an agent of redemption. You're bringing Messiah closer through your love, through your baseless love. So over the next 24 hours, I have an assignment. 24 hours. I want you to think about people who are in your orbit but are not in your tribe. So who are the Samaritans in your life? They might be your neighbors. They might be your family members. They might be your coworkers. So come up with a concrete plan about how you can reach out, how you can make a connection and show love to them. Show them that you see them as human. Just show love. Don't, don't put conditions on your love. Don't, try, don't even try to win, you, win them over to your tribe. Just show them love. So I want you to pray, to pray and ask God to open your heart. Because when you employ baseless love, you'll begin to see progress toward redemption. So if a typo on a party invitation could destroy the temple, then a heartfelt invitation, a friendship, could rebuild it.
Torah Club is the world's fastest growing Messianic Jewish Bible study. You can start or join a club today at TorahClub.org. Know Jesus better through an in-depth small group Bible study and fellowship with other like-minded disciples. Start a club or join a club at TorahClub.org. Torah Club is where disciples learn. Well, I always love listening to Aaron talk, but this year I think he really hit it out of the park. He 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 seems to really understand what's going on. I don't know. Um, there's people that listen to this podcast from all over the place, but uh, from my perspective in America, this baseless hatred thing seems to really be a problem. And we talked about factionalism, um, and it, to me, it just seems obvious. But I I just wanted to say, for the benefit of of any of our listeners who who came away from that lecture and think, yeah, those there's so many other people in our uh, culture that have baseless hatred. I think it's worth saying that no one thinks that they have baseless hatred. No one wakes up in the morning and thinks, "Man, I can't wait to get to get some hatred out there in the world today just for no reason." I can't I just I want to I want to just impact some people in the most negative way possible. I want to cause pain and harm. No one thinks they have baseless hatred. Everyone who has any hatred thinks they have a really good reason for their hatred. I listen to this uh, I listen to a bluegrass band all the time in college. Um, that has a song, the end of the chorus goes, others have excuses, I have my reasons why. Right. So mm-hmm. everyone has reasons why they don't like people or they hate people or or they just don't call it hatred. They say, oh, I don't hate these people. I just think we should put them all in prison or you know, th- that none of them should be in our country or whatever. Um, so if you're listening and you think, oh, I don't have a problem with baseless hatred, I want you to, to know that this is a, I think this is a problem probably everybody has to some degree. And give it, you know, give it a little bit more thought. Um, it's it's okay to consider that this might be happening in your life. In fact, if, if it is, if you have any of this in your heart, you'd want to know, right? I mean, this is something you want to know about. Explore yourself a little bit. I mean, be try to be aware. I think everyone has this problem. I mean, am I wrong about that? Well, I, you know what? I think the challenge is the word hatred. I think very, very few people would would ever classify or qualify the feelings they have as hatred. And I know that's kind of your point, is that you're saying no one no one thinks of it that way. So I, I guess maybe this sense of like looking at other people who think differently than you with such disdain. Uh, Mm -hmm. because of their ignorance and, you know, supposed ignorance because it's different than what you think. I guess you can, you can, you could kind of get that into hatred, but I think that's the turnoff point. I think maybe some people might disconnect when you're talking about telling people they hate. I don't think many people hate strongly dislike but you know what um i you mentioned something about this the being an international podcast and i was struck yesterday when i was talking with uh paul sung who is the he's the emissary to korea for for torah club our first Mm. Fruits Zion small group bible study and he just got back from being in korea and it was so interesting to hear that the very same things that we're talking about in the united states he observed in Korea and Korea and mm. the, the, the Eastern cultures, I mean, s- seem so like, you know, disciplined and, and calm and reserved and full of respect and all these other kinds of things. But it was surprising to hear whether, whether he was talking about churches, government, politics, social, everything. We are in a time where whether it's full on hatred right now or not, we're headed that way. Uh, to to yeah. your introduction about you know the destruction of the temple and what what the sages really say caused that. So I I know exactly what you're saying, and I think we should we should help people to see that hatred sounds like a really strong word, but whether we're there or not, we're headed that way. Yeah. No, you make a really good point. No one wants to classify their own. No, no one, no one thinks they're a hater. You know, they just, uh, they think just everyone would be better off if we didn't have that kind of person. And there's, they're, they're, that's, that's love, right? To, to get rid of all the bad people. And, um, you know, we, fi- we just find ways to, to say that we hate people without admitting to ourselves that that's, 
And maybe we don't have really strong feelings, but it's our actions that 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 are to the detriment of uh, of certain groups of people or kinds of people, uh, whatever those groups or, or kinds of people might be. Well, and, I, um, I one, one way that I tend to find myself bordering on hate is if I watch um, too much too much TV or listen oh, to yeah. too much of too many things. If you know what I mean, there are so many, incre- there are so many divisive input sources out there right now that it, mm. it can push one quickly to coming face to face with, uh, that bad word hate. Like, yeah. gosh, these people drive me crazy on, but, but let yeah. me be clear on every side of every, uh, on every side of every issue. Oh yeah. 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 If, uh, uh, I've been sort of disappointed with the news. Like I'm old enough. I remember growing up watching the news and it was boring. And now they try to make the news real spicy. Um, but the way that they do that, I think, is a lot of times to prey on some of the worst the worst human emotions. They they want you to be afraid. They want you to feel and they want you to feel hatred. And there's there's always an enemy that they're up, up there on the screen. Look how terrible this person is or these people are. And it's on it's on the news, it's on social media. And I tell people, and I've been telling people this um, for years, you know, even from like the pulpit, turn it off, like unfollow, unsubscribe from people who only post negative stuff about other people or just like negative political stuff and memes, like turn off the television, clean up your social media feed. Like it should be baby walking first steps from your friend from high school or like cat pictures or landscape photography or like Bible verses. Why is, why are we subscribed to all this stuff that's gunking up our news feeds with just, it's making us feel negative feelings and like an antipathy toward people. I think we, we can just get rid of it. You don't even have to unfriend these people. A lot of times you can just unfollow. So they don't even know that you're not listening to them anymore. I mean, this is possible. It's within our grasp, Damien. I've had to basically stop and I won't, I won't call out the particular platforms, but I'm not really on any platforms. So I could call them all out. But I remember watching, scrolling through social media one day and realizing, oh my goodness, every time I do this, I'm angry. I'm either Mm -hmm. angry at something I have absolutely no control over. I'm angry at someone. I'm, why would I keep doing this to myself? You know? Yeah. And so to your point, and that sounds very judgmental and critical. I don't mean that that way. But if you are a person who finds yourself being driven to like anger and hostility every time you watch a particular uh, news program or get on a platform, just don't do that anymore. You know, it it has really worked wonders for me. Yeah, well, you make a good point as far as a lot of this stuff that we, that we get riled up about is stuff that we there's nothing we can do. You know, I don't need 13 different opinions on the Sri Lanka economic crisis because I'm still not going to know what's happening over there and I'm not going to be able to do anything about it. You know, Things we, you we get ourselves worked up a lot of times just for no reason. This is the three weeks. This is a very, very heavy time. And, and mm. to just be clear, if I didn't already say it, the three weeks in Judaism from the 17th of Tammuz, when the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Romans and prior in the Babylonians, to the 9th of Av, three weeks when the temple was destroyed. It is a very somber time. So that's why I'm going to say what I'm going to say right now, because this is, we'll call it the three-week podcast, even though it's really actually about a really good thing, which is baseless mm. love, which we'll bring it back around to. But I've lost hope in a lot of things. Government, you know, conservative, liberal, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I feel very powerless to affect any change at all in in much of anything. And I still care. I will still vote. But it's a very sad realization. I, it seems that the system is sort of short-circuited. Representative democracy seems like anything but. But, you know, I, I always remember we are representatives of something that will never fail. Every day, we have the power to affect good things. We are always in control of something. Get out there and talk to people everywhere you go. I had a friend who recently went to a Starbucks to get coffee and he walked in and the gal behind the 
gal. I think I just dated myself. The young lady behind the counter, <laughs> uh, her name tag was Beelzebub. That was who served him his coffee. And you know what? I thought, what would my immediate reaction be? What would I do? How would I respond to that? And we're talking about baseless love. I think there would be a point where I would immediately say, oh, not, not in my tribe. Uh-uh. <laughs> She's at odds with, with God, with my belief system. Does she, does she deserve my baseless love to actually be having a, a Satan on her name tag? But my yeah. friend just talked to her. He just had a regular conversation because he could, and that was something he could affect. And, and that's what we get the opportunity to do every day, which is sort of a little bit of, you know, the, that is the point of this, of this lecture that Aaron just gave is that's our task. We are representatives of, of Messiah, of, of hope in, hope in the kingdom. Yeah, I mean the, the the language Paul uses when he talks about God extending His mercy to Gentiles. All the Gentiles in Paul's time were idolaters. None of them deserved to have God's mercy. They they had all rebelled against God by worshiping, you know, idols of stone and gold and silver and whatever and wood. And and Paul and Paul says when when we didn't deserve it, God extended His mercy, His His baseless love to us. And so what's we we are supposed to imitate him, right? And this is a, a core component of of both Christian and Jewish theology: the idea of of, of imitation, right? Um, yeah. The the sages the sages say, "How can you cleave to God when He's a consuming fire?" Well, you do it by imitating His attributes, His kindness, His acts of kindness, His mercy. And of course, in Christianity, you have imitatio Dei. You have the imitation of of God as a core component of of your your spiritual development. We all know this. We all have this. It's just when you get out there. If if you have been if you've allowed yourself to develop this antipathy, this factionalism, to where you're not really seeing people as as God's creations, whom He loves as much as He loves us, you know it 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 can get in the way. But like Aaron said, the antidote. Well, it's hard to do. It's it's hard to do. You know, it's it is it is hard to do. I mean, I have to. You got to be honest about that. Yeah, no, it, it is. But I guess you know that's 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 the job. That's the calling. That's what you signed up for. It is, yeah. And, and part of representing God in His world is is to is to show people that um, His love and His care for them and His mercy. And uh, part of that is meeting people where they're at. And I really like the way Aaron put it. You know, it doesn't mean you you agree with them on everything. You might not agree with them on anything, but you show them basic respect, basic courtesy. Um, you show an interest in their lives, try to understand where they're coming from. All this stuff is, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say it's a lost art, but I, I feel like uh, we don't see it nearly as much as as we should. I agree with that. Absolutely. I, Aaron, Aaron's, the, the quote was, this doesn't require capitulation to an ideology or to their mm -hmm. ideology. And I think that is the great compromise that people feel like they are, or, or they, that is called a compromise. And what I mean is, you know, especially in, in some of the circles that we run in, how could I possibly be nice to somebody or how could I possibly elevate or invest in, in when someone is so wrong, when they're, when they're such a sinner, when, when me being showing them great love could get, could, could send the mixed message that they don't need God. And you know, that, that the black and white world hmm. that so many people want to paint and say that we live in and the, the, there is right and wrong my goodness sakes i'm not i'm not suggesting that and we don't dance around with flowers in our hair and sing kumbaya there are real problems but i guess what we're talking about is the fact that how we represent god and yeshua is the open door to possibly affect change in the world and that is what we're in we're, we're in charge of that you know gatherers not scatterers yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the the mission, the the great commission that we've all heard so many times. Go make disciples. You can't. You can't. If you if you never talk to people who are not disciples yet, if you don't show them God's love and if you don't show them basic respect, and 
you're not going to be able to make disciples. If you decide to circle the wagons and everyone out there is an enemy and we're not going to talk to them, we're not going to be cordial with them and we're just going to, you know, we're just going to fight, 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 fight. Well, it's it's almost like you're giving up. You say, well, we tried to make disciples. They didn't want to be disciples. So we're going to, we're going to huddle in our faction and, and be done with it. Well, that's, that's, we don't have that option. We got to, we got to stay on mission. We got to, we got to show people the kingdom. We have to bring that kingdom into reality in small ways. We have to make disciples. And uh, we can't do it with baseless hatred. We got to do it with base, uh, baseless love. Remember a couple of weeks ago, Parsha Korach, right? The Korach's dispute. It's never. It's not ever called Korach and Moshe's fight. It's just. It's just Korach's issue, because mm. he challenged Moses. And there's a section in Mishnah vote where it says, "Every dispute that is for the sake of heaven will, in the end, endure. One that is not for the sake of heaven will not endure." Which is the controversy mm. that is for the sake of heaven? Such was the controversy of Hillel and Shammai. Aaron referenced Hillel and Shammai. Which is the controversy mm. that is not for the sake of heaven? Such was the controversy of Korah and all his congregations. Hillel and Shammai went, not so much them, but their disciples after them went at it. I mean, we, he yeah. talked about the knife point uh, challenge and, you know, but but... At the end of the day, it talks about how they were they got along because everything they were invested in, what they were fighting in, was actually for the 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 glory of of God. It was to help the Jewish people live and 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 prosper. And yeah, it got heated and they argued. But the difference was that Korah. He just wanted power. He just wanted position. He just wanted authority. He just wanted the spoils. And so that has, God does not look, look kindly on that. And I think it is reasonable for us to, to always think as we're engaging in argument, Judaism values argument. It's absolutely a foundational component of, of, Judaism and Jewish thought. Is this for the sake of heaven or is this for destruction? And so much going on around us is for the sake of destruction. And so the baseless love is the argument for the kingdom of heaven. It's not that we can escape argument. We need to engage in argument. Sometimes we have to. There's wrong in the world, so many wrongs. But but to, to have a Korah mentality is where it all falls apart. And that is that ahavat chinam. We must, mm. must do our part to have the baseless yeah. love emerge. Yeah, well, it just reminds me of what Aaron said in, in, in the lecture, which is that um, we're always going to find things to disagree about amongst ourselves. There's always going to be some arguments, something to to hash out. And maybe, we'll, maybe we won't be able to hash it out. Maybe we'll still disagree on you know, theology or politics or whatever it is, but that disagreement happens within the context of a relationship based on love and mutual respect. Um, and I think that again, it's it's the key to the to the end of the exile. We're not going to get anywhere unless we can get a handle on this thing. Yeah, one of my favorite teachers. I'll just I'll let you wrap it up after this, but. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory. He has this uh, great Torah commentary, covenant and conversation. And just recently during Parsha Chukat, he um, there's a he lists the the sages conflict resolution strategy. And I just wanted to read it and let people um, just meditate on it. Number one, respect different perspectives. Two, listen actively to your opponent. Try to understand the logic of his or her position. Three, never use force, physical or psychological. The only legitimate weapons are logic, argument, tradition, and persuasion. Four, be open to the outcome. You may be right, but you must be prepared to be proved wrong. Five, see disagreement not just as conflict, but as collaborative activity in pursuit of honesty and truth. That's a, that's a pretty big one. Six, accept it as a legitimate, even holy part of life. 
sometimes, you know, the heated arguments, we, we, we walk away each having learned something. But the last one I love, number seven, keep talking. Mm. Keep talking. And we might be able to That's say, a big one. Keep, keep loving, you know, just, mm. just find a way to do what so much of the world is not doing right now. Man, that's that really sums it up, doesn't it? Um, yeah. It reminds me it reminds me of a book that I read that's uh from the corporate world called Leadership and Self-Deception that talked about a lot of those same yeah, things. Um cuz anytime you get people together whether it's uh disciples of Jesus or you know employees of some company there's going to be conflict and and e even in the business world they realize it's going to ruin everything if we're all backstabbing, hating, whatever. So here's how here's how to see something from another person's perspective, but I really like the way that Rabbi Sachs summed all that up. That's yeah. if we could just memorize those uh, uh, those principles, man, we'd be a lot better off. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening to Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. Hey, we've got lots more to come in future episodes, including one guest I'm pretty sure you've heard of. So watch this space, like, comment, subscribe, tell your friends about us, and give us a five star rating on the podcast aggregator of your choice. And we'll see you next time. Shalom. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. This podcast is an extension of Messiah Magazine, available at messiahmagazine.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review along with a five-star rating wherever you're listening now. Today's podcast was hosted by myself, Jacob Franzak, along with Damian Eisner. Our executive producer is Boaz Michael, and the editor-in-chief is Daniel Lancaster. This episode was directed and edited by Jeremy Schoenwald. Original music was written and performed by Joshua Aaron. The show notes for Messiah Podcast were edited by Candy Bishop and are available at messiahpodcast.org. If you are interested in learning more about the Bible from a Messianic Jewish perspective, check out Torah Club, which is an international network of small study groups who meet weekly to study the Bible together from a Messianic Jewish perspective. To start a club or join a club, go to TorahClub.org. Until next time, Shalom. Let his word cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea Let his love cover you and me Like the waters cover the sea